Finally, at last, after what seemed like an interminable time, for the average reader as much as for Job and his companions, in Job 38 to 42, God finally puts in an appearance, a dramatic theophany, a revelation of God's presence. But it's not what anyone expects. God seems to ignore the issues Job and friends raise. God answers questions with his own questions, which seem to taunt Job and company. By extension, he seems to taunt us too. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Job 38, 4 to 7. God's sh sharp and dramatic statements seem to go back to Job's seven curses of uncreation. Reversing Job's reversals, God reaffirms creation and his power in it. There is beauty and order in creation, even in the chaotic. The chaos itself is an expression of order. We mere mortals simply don't understand it. Yes, indeed. And from an ecological perspective, we might draw this out further. We are part of this cosmos, not masters over it. We are subject to creation's process. And this process is too long, too big, and too complex for us to comprehend. God delights in this creation for itself. But it's actually a dodge of the question Job has been asking, why am I suffering unjustly? It's a kind of answer too. God is master over nature, over the forces of chaos. This is itself a mystery and a mirror of the divine mastery over chaos one finds in ancient Near Eastern mythologies. But is this a God we can identify with elsewhere in the Old Testament? Is this the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who intervenes in the lives of people and acts sometimes to liberate them? Well, no. Where before in the Old Testament you have a God who intervenes, here is a God infinitely different from his creation. Now this may be true. And even today we may see this in the fact that bad things happen to good and bad people alike. Now there's undoubtedly an order in creation. Your human minds can't understand it, God seems to say. Nature is relentless, and history, it seems, has no clear magical cause and effect. And God's response to Job is that theophany, that encounter. This is what Job asked for, some little sign that God at least knew what Job was undergoing, and that God cared. You see, I'm not so sure of this last bit. The God of the whirlwind in Job is not exactly a caring God. His bottom line seems to be, if I may paraphrase it, Oh, for God's sake, shut up, you stupid little worm. I'm God, you're just a creation, you know nothing. And Job seems to accept this. And he responds, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I accept and repent, a child of dust and ashes. Chapter 42, verses 5 to 6. And so Job is satisfied and repents. And does he? And more so, should we? And should he? The Hebrew language is flexible enough to admit a variety of meanings to words. And from the point of view of drama, and remember that above all, this is a story, a dramatic story. The same things can have different, even opposite meanings, depending on something as simple as the tone of a person's voice. Consider that statement. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I accept and repent, a child of dust and ashes. Say it with fear and trembling in your voice. Then say it with intense sarcasm. Say it with gratitude, or say it with anger in your voice. Whichever way he says it, Job admits 
that before God he is nothing. He is silenced. And he seems, some commentators say, to know God in a new way. But, I would suggest, this new way does not make him love God. He knows that God exists, that God is infinitely powerful, but hardly lovable. He knows God. God won't answer. And we, the readers, know even more because we are in on God's dirty little secret, the bet between him and the Satan. So as we read God's response, even if we accept everything that God says about God's role in creation, we still see that God truly is a blusterer, a voice from a whirlwind, a lot of hot air that does not tell the truth directly. Now this poses a lot of questions for us about God. Next week, I'll try to bring our exploration of Job to a conclusion by looking at what this book, with all its questions, might invite us to consider about our relationship with God. So until then, see you next week.